Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who's out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hi, welcome to the podcast, The Exploding Human. I'm Bob Nickman. Glad you're uh, tuning into this. We've got a great episode. I say that every time, but it is. I'm talking to comedian Kathy Labman, hilarious comedian that that I know from my days as a stand-up. And uh, she's going to be talking about her uh, struggles uh, with anorexia and how she has learned to manage this disease that she's been living with for a long time and uh, the family dynamics, psychology, and genetic components of anorexia, with a lot, which a lot of people don't uh, know about the genetic piece of it. And it's a, it's a great conversation. She's incredibly honest, very, very insightful, and absolutely hilarious. I said hilarious wrong. How did I say that wrong? I want to keep it in. I like mistakes. And uh, a delight to talk to. She's a delight. That's true. So listen in. We're going to talk about anorexia with Kathy Labman. Here she is. Do you always get the same mic or you don't know? No. Oh, because you, you could you could be using the mic I used last time. And, right. And people I interview are very clean. <laughs> you mean hygienically? Yeah, clean? hygienically clean. Yeah. Yeah, I, I make okay. sure. And uh, some of my interview over Skype, so the the second microphone, oh. not, not an issue. Oh, okay. And the last person I interviewed in person was a uh, existential therapist. So okay. you might in theory get sick, but you won't yeah. really. Okay. Yeah. How is it doing it over Skype? Does it work well? Not as well as this, no. sitting in a room together. No. I mean, okay. you don't get the, you get the little delay, and then sometimes you get technical stuff. Right. But this is this is my favorite. Right. To, to actually sit with somebody face to face is better. Yeah. yeah. So we're, you know, uh, so the thing is, I've probably done an intro already that somebody listened to <laughs> who's listening to this, but right. We're going to be talking about your eating disorder, um, which I we have to are. Say, I'm oh, kidding. I'm okay. Kidding. <laughs> well, we can talk about your illustrious stand-up <laughs> I'm, career, I'm that we kidding. Can, and which we may throw in there at no, the same no. time. You may have to, Be, um, because I think that the uh, you know a lot of great comedy comes out of uh, you everything's know, interrelated. Yeah. Yes. There's, there's some pain, and then there's mm-hmm. some humor to deal with the pain, as we all know. I'm in pain right now. <laughs> I'm going to be hilarious. Are you chafing? <laughs> <laughs> Emotionally. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I yeah, you know, I always say people don't become stand-ups who are like happy and well adjusted. I don't think so. I mean, there are some that just don't let you in at all. But I th- I think there has to be some there has to be some pain somewhere. I would hope. I would hope so. I mean, why why would you subject yourself to making strangers want to like you? I know. <laughs> if you I mean, already like yourself, <laughs> exactly. If you don't have that deep seated need. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about the, your eating disorder, and I have to say, I know nothing about it. Now my foot is caught in a, in oh a wire. Gosh. These are cool boots. But they I, are nice but, boots. But what kind are they? This is from the... Uh, they're beautiful. Doc Martin. I want a pair of Doc Martins. Doc Martin, yeah. Okay. Important to have good shoes when you're doing an interview. It is. Um, so we're going to talk about, and I know nothing about your eating disorder. I, okay. I like, eat too much, and mm-hmm. everybody in my family are, are one of those people. Okay. So, you know, my side of the thing, which is not really a huge issue for me, uh, is that. But I know that you're, you are the other way. What well, would you call yourself? Well, uh, anore- I call myself anorexic as, as, a, as would anyone who's diagnosed me would call me anorexic. But I recently found out that it's genetic. You know, I heard that recently myself, and I was going to ask you that. I'm so, let's start yeah. with that, because most people think 
somebody who's anorexic has a psychological disorder of some kind. Well, and there a, may be some pieces to it's that. It's a combo. It, okay. What it is, from what I've read and learned as of recently, is that you you are predisposed to it genetically. There's something on one of your genes that um, is sort of like a marker. Uh huh. And if you grow, if you are in an environment uh, or, or have other characteristics like perfectionism, compliancy, um, over, are overly responsible, um, and, and you're in an environment that fosters these things, then it's likely that the anorexia will manifest. Okay, so a perfect storm of genetics right. and uh, so, uh, na- so, uh, nurture. Right, so fr- from what I understand, and I'm not sure about this because it's kind of new, and I'll tell you about how I was treated back in the 70s. Okay. But um, if, if you have the gene and the predisposition, but you don't have all of these other things to help foster it, then you might not manifest it, I think. Wow. I think. But listeners, please don't go by me. This is new. Yeah. Do your own research, right. please. Yeah. But that's what I've learned recently. But what happened was um, I, st- I, um, I was never real. I always liked eating when I was a kid. I I loved food. I never thought about it. My family was a big food family. You know, we loved talking about food and going out to eat. And we had our. Fa- I mean, we were very, we were very passionate about food. Um, my mother was not a great cook. Um, she was a serviceable cook. She had a few. There were a few things she made that I liked. Um, but I ate strangely at a certain point. I start like I, I guess when I was in like elementary school, I started eating like strange snacks. Like I had this. I'm doing a show about this, by the way. Uh, I'm and developing a solo show about this. A, 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 a stage show. A stage show okay. called um, "Does This Show Make Me Look Fat?" Oh, I love that. And I'll be there. <laughs> okay, great. And um, so. I started to eat these strange, like, after-school snacks that weren't, like, what you normally, a kid would normally eat after school. I would have things like gefilte fish or steak tartare. Like, when my mother would make meatloaf or meatballs, she would save some of the raw seasoned meat for me because she knew I liked it. And I don't even remember how we knew that I liked it. I must have tasted it in some way. Did she offer it to me? Did I stick my finger in the bowl? I'm not sure. But... It was known that I liked it, and she would save a, a small uh, amount for me in a custard cup, in one of those Pyrex custard cups, and it would be in the refrigerator waiting for me, and I would either eat it right out of the custard cup with my little baby spoon, which I used for years, which I thought I still had, but I can't find it. I think my daughter lost it, and she insists that she didn't, but I think she did. And it's always important for me to get blame into every interview <laughs> that I do. Well, I'm very angry so. with her for this too. I mean, I think she's lying and she, she needs some help. She does. I mean, I gave her my first coach bag. I lent it to her and I saw it recently in the closet. It had a big oil stain on it. I said, how did that get there? And she goes, it was like that when you gave it to me, which was total bullshit. Right. Anyway, so... Um, I would, so I'd either eat it with my little baby spoon or I would spread it on a piece of rye bread. We seem to always have rye bread in our house, either Levy's or Grossinger's rye bread. It was an East Coast thing, I think. Remember, you don't have to be Jewish to eat Levy's rye bread. Where are you from? I No, I'm from Ohio. We didn't. We had rye bread, but we but did you didn't not, have not Levy's or Grossinger's? Well, no. Grossinger's was very New York because Grossinger's was a, was a, the a resort. hotel in, yeah. in the Catskills. But Levy's was... Maybe it was a New York thing too, but it was a great ad campaign. They'd had all different ethnicities, and it would say you don't have to be Jewish to like to eat Levy's rye bread. It was great. Did it anyway, was like comma, but it helps. Um, <laughs> it helps to be. <laughs> I don't know. You know that that might have been the tagline, but I don't know if they were no. looking to alienate people. No. Um, it was not the tagline. No, I just, maybe I wrote it myself. Okay, but I like that's it. That's why I'm not in the advertising. <laughs> in the ad biz. It was so, good up till you came in and added that thing, and now we've lost sales yeah, by like 70%. Right. Let's lose Nickman's tagline. <laughs> um, anyway, so I would spread it on a piece of rye bread and then put pickle slices on top. I don't know how I discovered these things, but I did. 
and sometimes I would eat, eat blue cheese. I mean, just things that were not kid foods, you know? They were very kind of gourmet foods. Okay. And then I recall when I um, was about nine or ten years old, I used to watch The Three Stooges every night. I would also eat certain foods when I watched certain TV shows. Like when I watched The Price is Right, I would want to have cream of tomato soup. And Wow, this is so interesting to yeah, me. Yeah, I, I don't know there why. Was a, there was like the... The thing you're watching had a food that went with it. It was very emotionally connected. I my love foods. this. This is so interesting. I love the human mind and how it works. The it's man from Uncle, I would have cold cereal, either Captain Crunch or Cocoa Puffs. Um, and then the Three Stooges, I would make myself this snack every evening. It was on at like 5.30. Not a whipped cream pie? <laughs> Not a whipped cream pie, No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would have been would funny, be, though, <laughs> that I would put my head face down yeah, in the pie. Uh, yeah, I take a bite, and then I smash it in my, <laughs> my mother's face. That was the three stews. <laughs> uh, what I would make was a tomato juice cocktail with, um, and it would be in, a, in an old jar that, that used to come with uh, cream cheese with chives in it. My mother saved, you know, every container that food came in. And food used to come in much better containers. I mean, it yes. came in actual glass. You Things know. you could reuse as yes. actual um, uh, silverware. Like jelly jar glasses, yeah. you know. Um, so um, I would make a tomato juice cocktail with um, t- salt and pepper and Worcestershire sauce. And I was basically making myself a Bloody Mary. Yeah, without and the alcohol. Without the alcohol, right. And then I would take a single slice of bologna and I would put it on a small plate. <laughs> and <laughs> bologna. I would go, yes. I would go down to the den mm-hmm. and I would watch the show. And this is how it would go. It was a 30-minute show. For the first 25 minutes of the show, I would... This is in my show, in my stage show. I would um, drink the tomato juice cocktail, taking little tiny sips... Or I would take little spoons fill, spoons fill with my baby spoon. Once again, the baby spoon. And then for the last five minutes of the show, I would pick up the plate and I would lick the bologna to make it last longer for the rest of the show. And then at the very end of the show, I would eat the bologna kind of like with my teeth like, like this in concentric circles, working my way to the center of the bologna. So there was a ritualistic... Very ritualistic, yes. I, I get that. I eat an apple a certain way like that. I eat around the middle, uh huh, completely around the middle. Right. And then I eat the top uh huh, around, and then I eat the bottom. bottom. And that's the way I eat it. I, right. Um, How else would you eat an apple? I mean, I, I eat an apple like that, I guess. I, I don't know. But, <laughs> but it's interesting that people... I think more people, uh, uh, if they thought about it, have food rituals. Well, so was Maybe the, not as extreme as mine. Yeah, so was the bologna like the dessert, the treat at the end? The I guess I wanted, I would always save, I always saved what I liked uh, best la- for last. Okay, so, th- and then I how s- did it become uh, where you weren't eating enough? Well, okay, so I started to gain weight like in middle school, high school. I was very unhappy. I hated living at home with my parents. My, both of my sisters were away at college, and, um, you know, they were just, all of their attention was on me in a very bad, smothering, um, uh, mean way. My father was, was a rager and, and very, he was terrorizing. My mother was just invasive. And um, my, like my father would check my bell bottoms before I left the house. If he was still there, if he hadn't left for work yet, he would check the length of my bell bottoms and if they touched the floor I had to go change my pants and you know that bell bottoms had to touch the floor they had to be ripped clean that's how you shortened your bell bottoms by having them yes. rip off at the bottom and the fact that they touched the floor meant what to him that you were not arrogant now my father he didn't like teenagers my father owned a bowling alley and he did not like <laughs> oh, that would do it <laughs> he did not like teenagers he did not like when they hung out he goes excuse he would walk up to them he goes excuse me are you bowling no we're just hanging out no there's no hanging out here you have to leave you either have to bowl you have to leave so anything that smacked of disrespect that type of a of a kid he would 
he had a visceral reaction to it, even though I was nothing like that. I felt very unseen as a kid. You know, I was nothing like these people. Just because I wanted to wear long bell bottoms didn't mean I was smoking cigarettes in bowling alleys, you know, but that's how he saw it. So he wouldn't let me wear makeup, you know, he... Well, no, you know, if the if they're too long, that leads to teen pregnancy. <laughs> that's at least that's right. That's right. No daughter of mine's gonna have her dungarees touch the ground. Dungarees, that's right. <laughs> so, um, you know, so it, I was very unhappy in high school. I got out of school as quickly as I could. I was I was just sixteen when I went away to college, and I started to really enjoy life in college. I started to smoke pot. Um, I didn't eat well because I didn't, I didn't have good eating habits. My mother made canned vegetables when I was growing up, horrible salads. So I didn't eat those kind of foods. I didn't learn to eat them until well into my twenties. Um, and I like them now, but I was, I did not have good eating habits. So I was eating a lot of bread, meat, cheese. Ugh! can you just, you know. Feel the lethargy from that. Yeah, and the bulk of that. Oh, the my God. Maybe and you I needed just, that just to feel grounded. I just started, maybe. I just started putting on weight. And at one point, I can I can just see myself in overalls and just feeling like really disgusted with myself. And I had a best friend at the time. We, we were almost, we were very close. I, I would say too close. Her name was Lauren. And um, we did everything together. And we lived together, and uh, so we decided uh, we wanted to lose some weight. And I went back to the doctor at home one vacation, and I spoke to him about losing weight. He says, yeah, you could cut back a little bit. I weighed 127 pounds. I'm like 5 feet 4 inches. And it was a little bit too much for me, I felt. Over a period of two or three years, I lost over 40 pounds, like a third of my body weight. Oh. Yeah, so the lowest I weighed that I remember that I actually saw on a scale was 84 and a half pounds. That's a lot of body weight. It's a lot of body weight. Yes. And I lost my period. Um, because my, your body systems break down in order of importance. And my, my reproductive system was not, is not, you know, essential to my being alive. Mm -hmm. So my body stopped that. And I felt, you know, I was very, I was in complete denial. And um, it was in the 70s, and there was not a lot, it was not a lot of knowledge around this. It was not part of the vernacular. People weren't really super aware of it. I'm sure, look, there have been anorexics way before me. I mean, I just watched a Joan Didion documentary. I'm pretty sure she was anorexic. She weighed like 75 pounds at one point. Um, Vera Ellen, the actress who was in White Christmas, um, they think that she was anorexic. I mean, but but this was not part of social knowledge, you know. So um, you know what, what's when I'm sort of hearing, uh, you know, I don't. You can speak to it, but the control part of how you controlled your life with what you were taking and your, that discipline, and the control that you were exercising over your weight it gave it gave uh gave you the sense of feeling a feeling um that you had power over chaos mm-hmm. an inner chaos this is what i'm yes thinking yes it made me feel safe it made me feel like things weren't going to go horribly the way they had yeah. for a very long time when I was, you know, living at home. So oh, you know, I forgot something very important. Okay. The thing that r- that I considered to be a real pivotal point was with Lauren, back to Lauren. Um, we were living together and we were living with these guys, our friends Howie and Bob, and my parents did not know about it because they would have been very upset that I was living with guys. And... Um, then Howie and Bob moved out the next year, and Lauren's younger sister and a and a friend of hers, a guy, moved in to the apartment. And they were two years younger than me and Lauren, than Lauren and I. And um, it just started, like, the atmosphere in the apartment was starting to become unpleasant. There were a lot of 
kids hanging out there. We couldn't get into to shower. You know, it would just be, it was not working. And, and so I went back to my parents' house for the weekend, like three hours away from school. And, um, I told them all about everything. And I said that I was really unhappy there. And I called Lauren and we talked on the phone and she said, look, I've decided that I'm going to stay. But if you feel like you can't stay, you want to move out, then I get it. That's fine. So I thought about it and I talked about it with my parents and I decided I was going to find another place. So when I came back and I told Lauren, she just stopped talking to me. She just stopped talking to me. She wouldn't look at me. She passed me in the hall and, and finally... Uh, you know, I moved out, and and it was just oh. it was just bizarre. I mean, bizarre behavior, completely out of my control. And so your I best finally, friend just all of a sudden went, it was, "You're dead to me uh, by her behavior." It was horrifying. I mean, it was like it was the most unsafe that I could have felt. And I remember waiting outside of a classroom that I knew she she had a class at a certain time, and I waited outside of her classroom until the class let out, and. I saw her coming out, and I remember what she was wearing. She was wearing plaid with a plaid cape or something. And and I said, Lauren, I really would like to work this out. I don't want to talk about it. And she says, well, I don't. And she, like, spun on her heel and, and walked away. I mean, if I had been more mature, if I had had some more life experience, maybe I could have thought, wow, she's got problems, this woman. But well, I, clearly, it was more about her than you. Oh, but of course. At the time, you you I mean, felt it was, rejected. It like, was not about yeah. me at all. Yeah. And yeah. but but that's the the moment that I remember that I really started taking off weight. That that it became a goal of mine to become as small as I could. And so that took me down to eighty four and a half pounds, and. Um, you know, my, my mother would see, my mother would read the New York Times always, every day from cover to cover. And she would see articles every now and then. And she'd send them to me or hand them to me if I was living there. And, you know, I rejected my mother on every level at that point. So I wasn't really paying much attention to anything that she was saying. As a matter of fact, it was even more than that. I was running in the opposite direction. And these were articles about anorexia. About anorexia, because it was starting to become m- Talked more, about. more, pre- yeah, more prevalent and more, there was more knowledge being shared about it. And she even suggested, uh, maybe through a friend of hers, whose daughter went, that I check out Overeaters Anonymous. And I remember making a phone call, and then the recording said, if you want a meeting list to send 25 cents to some address. And I was like, ah, forget it. I hung up and that was it. You know, that I thought that's too much trouble. And, um, and besides my mother suggested it. So it's probably shit. What happened was I, I was very, I wanted to be a stand-up comic since I was like 13 and I wasn't doing anything about it. I had tried, I moved to Los Angeles at one point and didn't go near a comedy club and then came back and lived with my parents. And I was working in some horrible job in the billing department of an ad agency in Manhattan, living in, with my parents in Queens. And my boss, who was a very bossy woman, older woman, was very concerned about me and how I looked. Uh, and she said, you need to go see a doctor. And I guess I asked my mother, like, about this, and my parents just didn't know how to talk to me about this. My father, would, my father's cure for me was to open the refrigerator and take a piece of rye bread. That's what he said to me. That's what he thought would cure me. In, fa- in, in, in essence, just to eat. Right, right. You know. That's, Knock it that's, off. Yeah, exactly. Do this. Right. Yeah. So, and my mother just didn't know what to do because I rejected every suggestion and, you know, every, everything that she could offer me. So um, so I went to see this doctor. Th- my boss gave me the name of a doctor and gave me the phone number, and I went to see him. I remember where he was. He was near the Metropolitan Museum of Art on Fifth Avenue in New York, and I went one beautiful summer day, um, lunchtime, and he examined me, and then I went into his office. You know, he sat behind his desk, and I sat facing his desk, and he said to me, well, it's obvious you're anorexic. And no one had ever said that to me. No one had ever diagnosed me before. 
Whoa. So it was just, it just kind of like, here it is. And like he thought you had heard the word, obviously, and that you maybe had been thinking about it. It sounds like he wasn't very sensitive. Well, I don't know if it was a matter of insensitivity or not, but I remember feeling very humiliated because I thought that I was fooling everyone. I mean, I guess there was on, on some level I knew yeah. that there was something wrong with me, but I thought that I, th- I thought I was so much better than everybody else. I don't need food. I don't need to get my period. I'm, I'm superhuman. I don't have to have normal human functions. I'm, I'm alive and, and yet I don't have to live like you people. I'm not, you know, I'm not a slave to hunger. I can go right. there. I would teach my mother when we were shopping in the afternoon and she says, I'm hungry. I said, just let it pass. It'll pass. If you wait long enough, it'll pass. And I used to get headaches in the afternoon from hunger. But, um, I mean, I, I was an eighth grade English teacher and I was doing, I was practicing. So this doctor recommended that, uh, he recommended there, that there were like a few different ways I could go with it. There was, there was inpatient treatment, which I didn't want to do. And he, he mentioned that there was this place called the Ackerman Institute for Family Therapy in New York. And they were conducting a study on anorexia. And uh, it was for f- the family because it was um, thought at that point that anorexia was a family disease. It had to do with the construct of the family dynamic. Initially, it was just my mother and I. She was, you know, I called her as soon as I left the doctor's office and I asked her if she would come with me. And she said she was completely willing. My sister, Leslie, was not able to come because she was just about, she ju- had just given birth, I think, to a baby or was just about to give birth. And my sister Joanne and I had just had a fight, which we always had. We, we we never really got along great. I mean, there was a short period of time when we did. But um, so she didn't show up to the first one. And my father just flat out refused to go to therapy. He was a very anti-therapy person. Joanne eventually showed up and my therapist um, called my dad and spoke to him and I guess um, assured him that he wasn't going to be ganged up on by all the women in his family. And it wasn't, go- whatever she said to him, that it wasn't going to be what he anticipated it was going to be and that it was a very important to my welfare. I'm sure she stressed that it was very important to my welfare. This is just what I imagine, that he show up. And he did, and he was probably, you know, he was, I, when I watched, I have tapes of, videotapes of, of uh, a compilation tape of some of the sessions because they taped all these and they've u- they use these tapes to train therapists. And I actually know people who've watched the tapes. Oh my gosh. I know. Isn't so, it, and isn't you can it? see these tapes from... I have I have a copy. Yeah, I'll show it to How you. How many years like. ago was this? Now? This was in 1978. Oh, wow. Um, eight. Wow, that's amazing. 78, 30, 30 79. some years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, he was really great. I mean, it's amazing to watch my mother, who was the most willing to go, was the most defensive and still is a very defensive person, um, very um, unable to say I'm sorry. Whenever she apologized for something, my sister and I were like, wow, mommy apologized. <laughs> Can you believe it? Um, but it was very, it was very, oh, my stomach's, my stomach's growling because I'm hungry. I haven't had lunch yet, but... Um, Oh, this, this mic is so good that you can't pick that up either. No, do we? Should we order in? Nah. <laughs> Even though we're in a library, we can't. We can't <laughs> order in. You can't order in a library, can you? No. My no. daughter was in one of these study rooms with her friends, and they all they were eating, and they got in trouble. They got in trouble. Oh, you can't library. eat. Yeah. Oh, that's true. I guess because of like bugs and stuff. Yeah, like and that. food on the floor. It's right. uh, not the place. No, but anyway, so um, so we went to family therapy for a year. And then I continued on in individual individual therapy, and it really it it started me. Th- this turned it around for me. It started me on a path of healing, and I slowly began to gain weight. And when I began stand up, I probably weighed in the low to mid nineties, and so I was still pretty thin. Um, and um, I did eventually go to Overeaters Anonymous on the suggestion of a, th- of a th- therapist of mine that I had, s- had been seeing in Los Angeles. And that really helped me. Mm-hmm. That really helped me. And, and uh, I've been uh, 
in that program, although I haven't been to an, an OA meeting in quite a while. I've been in that program for over 30 years. So that deals with um, not just overeating. It's the relationship you have to food. To food, and right. What, what it means and what, what right. the emotional aspects are to uh, how you relate to food. Right, because in, in that program, you do not deal with the genetic component. You deal with the emotional and spiritual components. Let me just ask yes. you this, because this is always the question. You yes. hear people say, well, when I looked in the mirror, I, lo- I, I felt like I was fat. Yeah, Did I still see a fat person when I look in the mirror. Okay. And, but you know that it's not true. No, I don't know that. Oh, you don't know that. I really don't know that. Especially like, you know, at every point in my life, I have another excuse. Now my excuse is that I'm 62 and my body's aging and falling. And I'm now I'm, now I'm really fat. Now, this is the time when it's really true. There's, uh, it's always that. This is the time when it's really true. And, you know, my husband's really understanding about it. I mean, he's known for, you know, since we were friends. We were friends first. He's known for a long time um, about my anorexia and um, has always been compassionate and understanding about it. You've taken it from something that was very unmanageable to something mm-hmm. that you feel that you are managing pretty well these yeah, days? Yeah, I mean, I'm still anorexic. I'll always be anorexic. Um, but I can live with it in a healthier way. Um, like, after I, after we're finished here, I'm going to go home. I'm going to have lunch, albeit a late lunch. I'm going to have lunch. Um, and it used to be that I didn't eat lunch. Um, you know, my abstinence, you become abstinent in, in Overeaters Anonymous. That's, that's your sort of your sobriety. Mm-hmm. And it's a 12 step program. If, if people don't know, I don't know if anybody doesn't know that, but, um, um, you, um, get an abstinence and my abstinence has changed as I've gone through the program and things have become more refined as you grow and change, you know, you, you get more towards the center of who you are. So initially I didn't eat lunch. I would, hadn't eaten, lu- eaten lunch for years and it really impacted my social life. I would find myself uh, lying to people. Like if somebody asked me if I wanted to have lunch, I'd say, oh, I'm busy. But the truth was that I had already had breakfast so I couldn't have lunch. So I made a plan with, to have lunch with them another day and then I would know that I didn't eat, wouldn't eat breakfast because I was going to have lunch. I understand that. It was all very organic. <laughs> well, it's, you're a clever person. I mean, that's the thing about these, these types of, um, you know, uh, addictions or, you know, disorders, whatever you want to call them. Mm-hmm. People manage to figure out ways to move through the world so other people don't see it. And right. That they or can that convince they think themselves. they don't see it. Yeah. You know, I mean, how do you hide as an adult that, you're, that you weigh less than 85 pounds? Well, you, you can't. Know? Or even 95 pounds, you know. I mean, and I was over 100 for years, and then last year I was going through some difficulty, and I went to the doctor and I weighed 98 pounds, and I was very upset about it. Being below 100 was like old stuff for me. It had been years since I'd been, that I'd weighed below 100 pounds. Now there's also another aspect to our culture where like thin, 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 and... You know, I hear women, you know, enviously say, oh, gosh, she's a stick. I know. Like it's know. like it's some victory uh, in, in and fashion and, and beauty. Yeah. And um, so you probably get women that say, God, I wish I was thin like oh, you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had people so say, oh, I, I wish I was anorexic. I wish people I could wear what that. you can wear. Yeah, yes. I've heard that. I've heard yes. that. Yes. And I mean, obviously, it comes from a place of ignorance. They, they just don't know what, what, what it means to be anorexic because they wouldn't say it. But... Um, yeah, I think there's a big problem with the um, with society, fashion industry, and the entertainment industry. I think that, in a sense, they're in collusion with the disease because they look the other way. Dance, ballet. I mean, you you heard there are so many ballerinas who are bulimic. You know that they, they know they know what's going on, but they're making money from it, so they really don't want to attend yeah. to it. Like we don't really want this this woman to gain weight because she's making us so much money on the screen, so we don't want to send her into treatment. You know, so they're they're colluding with with the problem. Based on a uh, perception of what is what is beautiful, beautiful currently, 
right which changes uh depending on the era and right. the specific cultures right within the country you know like other cultures in our country don't see that as did you hear that story about it was a I read it somewhere. It was Leonardo DiCaprio uh, and his model girlfriend went to Africa on some sort of a vacation. Mm-hmm. And the people there felt sorry for them because they were so thin and undernourished. Really? <laughs> yeah. In like, Africa? It, yeah. It was, I don't know which country. If right. It was, yeah. I mean, it wasn't a starving right, population right. where they were, but it was, they were like, oh, these people, the, they couldn't believe that they were considered beautiful beautiful people they were like they felt bad for them because they were so emaciated Boy. and thin yeah um i, I mean just, i is, read it somewhere i don't mean not, it is mean. part of um our culture and and probably i mean the world has become a very small place and i think it's part of a lot of cultures i think it's part of a lot of european cultures probably but you know a, a also, but there there are ones that are healthier, like in Italy, you know, you, women, full women are really, um, you know, full healthy women are beautiful, admired. I mean, look at Sophia Loren. Sure. She wasn't skinny. No. Marilyn Monroe, not skinny. That was, a, that was the look back then. It was super, like, voluptuous and curvy. Yep. It was considered the, uh, the... Jane Mansfield, not skinny. Yeah. And then it's somewhere along the line, it kind of switched. You don't it, and now in the sixties. It switched in the sixties, I think. Although it could have switched in the fifth when when housewives started um, taking pills, I think, um, for their um, anxieties, their boredoms. Um, I think that that might have fed into it a little bit. And then people started taking a lot of drugs too, recreational drugs. That might have fed into it too. Yeah, it's hard. It's you know, or is it just you know, and the fashion industry and advertising just went, well, we can, we can make money in a whole new way now with different a different body Maybe. type. You know, I think that you look. I mean, you look at every every um, form of expression of a generation, and and each one is reflective of the other. I mean, it's it's hard to say where it starts. You know, music of an era reflects what's going on uh, socially, um, politically. Um, and, but then what, like who started it, you know, basically you don't really know where it started, yeah. but it's, it's, it's all, it's all, I think it's pretty, um, um, homey, uh, like what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, hom- hom- I don't know. Homogenous. Yeah. It's like a blurred line of when something starts and, yeah. and ends. Are, now you mentioned bulimia. Is that part of your story too? No, I'm, I was never bulimic. Yeah, that's a, a slightly different. No, if I ate too much, I just felt badly about it. But uh, what I did do, and what is like a source of, I mean, this is something that I discovered as a trick for me, because I would loved food. I loved food, and I loved eating, but I was afraid of eating too much. What I discovered with certain foods, like bready foods, really worked well with this. Um, pizza worked well with this. I would take a bite, I would chew it, I would swallow it, and then I would bring it right back up. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait until I threw up. There was no bile involved. It was like an immediate thing, and I would chew it some more. It was kind of like, I, I like maybe how a cow works. I'm not sure, but so it would be like you would trick your brain into thinking there was more food in there. Yeah, I would, I would trick myself. I would get this. Um, I would, I would prolong the sensual um, pleasure as long as I could from one bite of food. And that was how I uh, uh, got sated. Um, yeah. I, I, somebody was telling me that, that models, uh, a lot of models, they eat, uh, swallow cotton <gasps> to fill them up oh my in God. water. Now, don't Jesus. do this, anybody that's thinking about wow, it. Wow, like it, cotton balls yeah. or cotton fabric? Cotton balls. Oh, my God. Ugh. So uh, there's a little tip. So <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm always amazed at what people will do to get what they think they need. You I know, mean, yeah, people are. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, I I, pr- I pride myself, like I told you, I pride myself of never becoming addicted to any substances, but I became addicted to behavior. Very much so. Yeah. Sure. That's what I mean. It sounds like that was. Yeah, almost twenty four seven thinking about, uh, I'll say compulsively how you right. were going to um, 
manage your weight and, right. your, and your food. It was a, um, you know, it's just, I'm sure there was anxiety when it wasn't going the way you would want right. it to, per- perhaps. And look, there's, I mean, I'm, I still have, <coughs> I still have a, um, uh, a remnant of that left like a patina of that that's sort of uh, that I still operate within um it's not completely gone I, I and I, and I don't know if I don't know if it's ever completely gone I know I mean for some people I mean my my niece used to be anorexic but she's not anymore but I still hear her complain uh about food and weight and but I hear so many women complain about food and weight I think that it's more commonly a female issue that was going to be my next question yeah now are there men there are that are anorexic in you know when you are going to whatever you you know your 12 step or yeah there or, are mm-hmm. there are men who are anorexic there are men who are bulimic um, but it's less common yeah it's less common because I just think of the role that women play in society and the objectification of women uh, in a way that men are not objectified. Um, uh, I think that women feel that their looks are so important to their uh, station in life. Yeah, their success, their ability Mm -hmm. to attract a mate, their Mm -hmm. um, how they're seen by their um, other right. women, right? Uh, career, all that stuff is tied into looks. It's mm-hmm. really, um, it seems like it. Guys can get away with not being as quite as concerned yeah. about that. I mean, I I would think like obesity. Uh, it's probably both sexes, but there's a, it seems like there's a lot of big fat guys walking around. Um, to put it tactfully, do you think there are more <laughs> fat guys than women? No, I really I don't. Think, I think that I think obesity does not. Um, because there's different, there, there are different things that, uh, cause obesity. Um, I, and I do believe it's genetic too, but I think that, and that's complete, once again, I'm not a licensed therapist or doctor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I do think there's a huge emotional component, um, with obesity. There's but a lot of, all, you know, uh, and, but also with men, you know, uh, too, it's like, uh, I eat well, you know, I'm successful. Right. I, you know, and also I, I got a big old manly gut on me because I'm a beer drinker. I mean, there's a lot of sort of macho actually behind a certain amount of and it's, heft. And it's easy. It's much easier for men who are overweight, even slightly overweight, to find a, a partner than, than it is for a woman who's, who's overweight or slightly overweight. I think it's much harder. I think men judge women way more harshly. They do. I think they do. Um, that's usually... All of this is... For, is I've, I agreed to do this interview with you just so I could say, fuck you, Bob. Fuck really? you for being a man. Well, I, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now we're done. <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's not, it's not as easy as it looks, Kathy. It's not your fault. I think to a, to a certain degree, ma- each man individually has to take responsibility for his actions for his judgments but i think so much of it is bred into our society that it's you know and and you look at different social structures i mean look at saudi arabia where women are just now allowed to drive yeah hard to hard to imagine that Mm -hmm. it's just happening yeah i mean that's so fucked up yeah yeah i mean we're we have a pretty open culture compared to most, mm-hmm. but there's still quite a lot of uh, gender uh, issues going on. I, mm-hmm. uh, of course, uh, um, sometimes I find myself thinking a, in a way that I don't really th- want to be thinking, but by training, mm-hmm. and I have to catch myself, like going, you know, why am I assuming this person is a certain way because of the way they look, you know? Uh, right. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it's not a huge thing that rules me and I'm pretty aware of it. Right. But when I think about, you know, uh, I'll give you an example. The idea of, uh, you hear like guys uh, talking about uh, women's breasts and size being, uh, big, big breasts being important. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're a guy who that's not something you even find 
you know, necessarily importantly, you know, to the attraction, which I mm-hmm. don't. I don't. I don't. I never was like a big sh- breast guy. Well, I yeah, I like them, but I don't. I don't really. You know, the size is not like this. It was never a thing. Uh-huh. But but there were times when guys were talking that way that I would just go along with it because right. I want to fit in. When I was, you know, a teenager, not right. not probably past my 20s. But right, right. I just, you know, it just seems really stupid. Well, there's a lot of that kind of peer pressure. I mean, that that kind of goes into like areas of prejudice of, of all sorts. You know, kid, uh, one kid will start, somebody will gang up on one kid and then everybody will gang yep. up because they want to be thought that they're on that side of the issue, you know? So um, it's not just uh, the objectification of women. Yeah. Um, it's hard to be an individual. It really is. It is hard, and it's really important. I'm, one thing I'm so proud about my daughter, I think she's a, I think she's a real iconoclast. I think that she doesn't uh, blow with the wind, and I love that. That's a that is a huge uh, level of self confidence and courage mm-hmm. and earnestness that uh, is not that valued in teenagers for sure. Right. Um, I really, the older I get, the more I I just respect people that don't care what other people are saying or doing right. in terms of if if it's authentic for them. It's really quite right. lovely to see a teenager be able right. to do that. And you know, she's got her insecurities too, but I just. I love the way she, I just love watching her move through life, the way she dresses, um, the things that she wants to do. Um, I just find her, like I was asking her, you know, January 1st, um, oh, I shouldn't even mention the date. January, I'm going to say January 1st, pot became illegal in, in California. Um, no, the date is fine. But... But this is... We don't know when this is going to air. I know, but it's definitely going to air after January 1st. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. So... Yeah, so January 1st, 2018. Pot becomes illegal. Legal. I mean, Ill- illegal, excuse me. It becomes legal. Recreational pot becomes legal. Yeah, although it and essentially already is, uh, in effect. It, yeah, it, but... But now it's really legal. Yeah, and it's... And the thing is that I said to my daughter, I said, you know, and I, I, I bring this subject up with her... Um, consistently because she's in high school and I ask her if she smokes pot and she says, mom, you know, I'm not like that. I said, I, she said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of weed on campus. It always smells like weed there. And so I said, so what do you think it's going to be like after it becomes legal? She, and she said, I can't remember exactly what she said, but it's going to be like a, like a drug den or something like that. <laughs> and I said, well, what about, how, how are you going to fit in? She goes, I'm going to be in the minority. That's how she sees herself. And I said, look, I just want to reiterate again. If anybody offers you some, don't smoke with a stranger. Come to me and dad, okay? Because you, I, I, you don't know what you're getting and I don't want you to be doing it with a stranger. You know, I just don't want her to be like high and paranoid with someone, with people she doesn't know. It's just, I don't want her in that situation if, if it can be helped. Yeah. Um, but who knows if she'll listen to me and who knows if she'll even have it. I don't even know if she wants to. It'll be an interesting I- experiment to see how uh, society sort of uh, deals with it because like anything, there's going to be a downside as well as an upside and everything right. in between. Right. It isn't, you know, for or against really isn't really the issue to me. It's like what's going to happen across the board and is it worth doing and, you know... Uh, We'll see, you know. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, I drink wine in front of my daughter. So now, am I going to smoke pot in front of my daughter? It seems different somewhat because it's new. I mean, alcohol has been... I I feel like alcohol is way more harmful than marijuana. That's how what I personally think. Oh, here's a question. If you're smoking yes. pot... Do, you do I get hungry? Yeah. Yes, I do. And sometimes that's a little anxiety-provoking. The other night, I had a lot of crackers, and I was feeling like really anxious about having oh, okay. so many crackers. So you got the the munchies. I did. I was okay. very hungry. Um. Oh God, I'm starved. And um. Do you want to end soon? Whatever. No, no, no. Whatever. I can handle it. Okay. I don't know how long you have uh, the space. I could go for hours, but we'll go a little bit longer. And, okay. Um. I have a few more things. I'll okay. Ask. 
But yeah, I, I do get the, yet, I do get the munchies, and that concerns me. Really? That, that does concern me. Yeah. Yeah. And is there a certain type of food that you would be more uh, inclined? Like you said, crackers. But like most people, when they get the munchies, I guess it's been a long time since I've done that. Mm. But um, uh, you know, sweets and sweet or salty, yeah. either way. Strong, a either strong way. taste. Yeah, I mean, like what 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 wouldn't I want when I had the munchies? Uh, I don't think I. I don't know. There's a lot celery. Of no, I never want celery. <laughs> never, <laughs> ever. If I were starving and there was nothing else, yeah. I would eat celery. You're not a celery gal. I'm not. I love it. I'm not. I'll eat it if it has something on it, but I, celery itself, I wish I liked it because um, as an anorexic, it's, it's negative calories, celery. That is true. It's really you think that would be one of your go-tos? And I know, I really know, I mean, I, I'm aware of the calories and everything. I look at calories still. You know, I'm so used to that. Now, can you spot... Uh, an anorexic? An aff- yeah, and another have an, an affinity too. Like, do you sh- do anorexic swap trade secrets? Uh, do they mm. hang together? And not, not when they're like- sick. You know, it's interesting. There's a it, it's a very competitive disease. I would always want to be the thinnest person in the room. So, if there was another anorexic, I would be in com- in direct competition with her. Um, but where I've come across most of my anorexics is in a healing environment. So we're really not swapping secrets. Okay. I mean, if we are swapping secrets, we're telling them as a way of sharing our stories, but we're not telling each other trade secrets to practice. Yeah. Okay. You know? I was talking about back in the day. Yeah. No, because we're really not, we're not ones that hang together. We are in opposition of each other. That is an interesting thing. I remember reading, uh, hearing a guy, not reading it, I was, it was an interview with a guy who was a bodybuilder who was, you know, Mr. Steroid. He, and he said the goal was to have your head look as small as possible in comparison to the rest of your body. Like a tiny head. Oh, my God. Was a goal. That's so unattractive. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he, this guy, it was an interesting thing. I mean, he had, um, you know, his body image was tied to bulk and size and muscles. I find those bodies so hideous. Well, it's not sort of the way I don't think the bodies have been designed by nature. They're, they're, they're heightened by chemicals and, um, overuse of heavy metals right. <laughs> lifted up over your head. Jeez. <laughs> it's real. But to have your head as tiny as possible. Yeah. Well, this guy was talking about how it, how he, you know, lost jobs because he was sneaking off to the gym and not doing his work mm. and that he, every time he was at work, he couldn't wait to get out so he could go to the gym for four or five hours. He'd work out before work at lunch, after work. It was, you know, there an are absolute, exercise addicts. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a different manifestation, but it's still, you know, this idea of I'm not enough the way I am and I need to change that so I can feel okay. Right. There is exercise bulimia. I mean, people who work out just to work off the calories and ev- everything that they ate. That would take a lot of exercise to burn off calories. That, that yeah. Mm-hmm. But there are people who know what they need to do Yeah. for every type of food. Yeah. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to, to manage a disease. To I mean to, to practice a disease. Yeah. And it's work to manage it, but I think it's I think it's it's harder to practice it because you, what you end up with is not a happy person. Right. It's it's secretive and it's um it seems like you wouldn't be getting a lot of joy out of anything. No. And where does the joy come from now that you've made these wonderful uh, changes in your life to what does the joy come from yeah I mean I get joy from my uh, work although right now I'm going through a a phase in my work Um, but that's a that's for a different podcast Um, (laughs) I I have to go to a different room after this (laughs) to discuss that (laughs) but um, um, I get joy from my family. I get joy from my dog. I get so much joy from my dog. I get joy from my ho- hobbies. I get joy from movies. And these are things you probably did not get joy from when you were in the in the. Disease. I always got joy from movies. I okay. have to say, I always got joy from movies, and I get more joy from food now. Oh, okay. You know? I love to hear that. Yeah, I do get more joy, and I allow myself more things. I have gained weight 
recently I discovered that I gained weight, which has been a little challenging for me. I'm up to 108 pounds. Well, you you look very good. See, now, to an anorexic, that's almost like insulting. Is it? You don't want to hear you look good because that means that equals I look fat. No. You want to hear you look thin because that... Well, let me put it this way. But I'm just You look that's beautiful. Part, How about that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's part well, of when my wife saw you, that's what she said. Well, that's nice. Another woman. She said, that's Kathy nice. Labman looks beautiful. That's nice. Yes. But as and to through my anorexic brain, I hear it as I look like every other person, and I'm not outstanding anymore. I mean, that was my way of being outstanding. Okay. That was my way of being special. But you're saying it with an awareness that you know yes. that that's not the way you want to go. Uh, with no, your it's not how I want to live my life. It's not because it's a dead end. I mean, what's? I mean, what? I mean, why is it, you know, my, my, the worst part of my body for me is my stomach. I don't like my stomach. And it's always been where I've, my weight has gone first. And, and as I'm getting older, it's the shape of it's changing. And, um, I mean, like really when you, when you sit back with a little distance, why is a stomach so important? I don't know, but it is. I don't know either. (laughs) I don't know. Do you do setups and things like that? Yeah. Okay, so you do work out. I do planks. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, but you know, my skin has gotten like so, like gravity. I mean, I, I, I can't. I know you have that joke about extra skin, that you have that whole yes, I have bit so, about extra right, skin. Right, right. Um, Remember John Mendoza had a joke about, you know, you're fat when you can pinch an inch on your forehead. <laughs> <laughs> I love that joke. <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and pinch an inch was like such yeah. was like a real phrase back then. Right, yeah, it was a commercial for yes. what Kellogg's Special K, I yeah, think. Was, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Weight loss cereal. Right, how, it was how, a weight a loss cereal. That that, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they would put the they and the the ad was the um, tape measure would go around the box and it would cinch it in at the waist. <laughs> Such bullshit yeah. advertising is. Thank you, ad ad people. Mm. Well, thanks for talking to me. Uh, oh, sure. Do you have any more questions? I, I probably do, and I'll but think of them think in the car on the way home. But it's you okay. know, it was a great. Talk. We could do a part two. We could, <laughs> yeah. We can do. We could do that. Um, but you know, if if anybody if anybody hears this and and needs to um, and has any questions, they should be f- feel free to. Um, and you know, anybody who's suffering from this and needs to talk, I won't want them to feel free to uh, look me up because I'd like to be here. How, how are you looked up? You, you can go to my website, oh. com, oh. and you can email okay. me through there. I'd be happy to help anyone who's struggling. How kind. That's I'll, what I want to do. I think that's more important to me than a lot of things right now. Well, thank you so much. Oh, and thank uh, you, Bob. It's well, been fun. Yeah. Bye, Kathy. Bye, Bob. <laughs> Wow, Kathy Ladman. She was a delight, just like I said at the outset. Fantastic. Really enjoyed talking to her. And I am so happy that uh, you're listening to the podcast. I don't know who is, but somebody is. There's some numbers that come up on the uh, on the computer about people who are listening. So I'm happy about that. I hope that you come back and uh, listen again. I, I just love doing this thing. I love talking to these people. So uh, thanks for listening in, and we'll see you again.